Okay, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about extensive form games. So this is going to be an interesting application or interesting way to develop uh, some game theory and apply to an entry game. All right, so with an extensive form game, what we're doing is we are using a game tree to display the interaction. And so in previous games, probably the way that people are most introduced to game theory, you might see matrix games. That would be a way to describe games in strategic form or normal form. You don't need to use a matrix for normal form games because the Corno oligopoly is a game typically modeled in strategic or normal form. We don't use a matrix there. But uh, a lot of games that people would encounter in normal form are going to be matrix form. Here's an extensive form game, and we're going to use the other sort of model, which is a tree. So we will use a game tree to display the interaction. Trees consist of nodes and branches. The nodes indicate basically whose turn it is to move, and then the branches are going to be how we'll label branches to correspond to player strategies. So the nodes indicate whose turn it is to move. The player selects the outgoing branch that corresponds to their desired strategy. So here's an example of a game. So we have player one, where I circled one right here. They're controlling the first node, the initial node, and then player two, and player two. So here is player two after player one is selected A. Here's player two moving after player one is selected B. Now I'm regretting putting B here. I should have put B down here, sorry. And after one chooses A, then B makes a selection of either C or D. After one chooses B, two makes a selection of either E or F. And then here's the resulting payoffs. The first one is the payoff to player one. The second one is the payoff to player two. Right? And so, just for example, if player one were to select A, and player two were to select C, player one would get a payoff of one, player two would get a payoff of two. If, however, player two would select D, player two would get a payoff of one, and player one would get a, a payoff of zero. Player two probably not going to want to do that because they'd rather have this two, so conditional on player one selecting A, player two probably selects C. And at least that's consistent with Nash equilibrium. Okay, so one important observation though is that there's there's a there's a really important difference for player two choosing after player one is selected A versus after player one is selected B. And we're gonna pick this up with our definition of a strategy. So strategies are a complete contingent plan. And so therefore, if we enumerate the strategies for each player, we are gonna to have to in all cases, be sure to completely stipulate the behavior that would result uh, for that player uh, for each single strategy. For player one, it's easy. There's two actions, A and B, and so there's two strategies. For player two, there's four actions, C, D, E, F, and then four resulting strategies. These are combinations of, of what could happen. And so what's going on is, well, Two strategies are going to have to stipulate what two would do here as well as what two would do here. So player two strategies are C, E, C, F, D, E, and D, F. And, you know, right, so if we, so, right, so here we have C, E, uh, C, F, D, E, D, F. Uh, right, you could write this as E, C, F, C, E, D, F, D, and that's going to pick out the exact same type of behavior. The important thing we're picking up as we're stipulating that strategies are a complete contingent plan is the idea that when player two chooses, after or when player two chooses, it matters if player one has chosen A or B. And um, and then the other thing is strategies as a complete contingent plan is telling us that we have to know what player two is going to do. Uh, wherever they might be, wherever they might find themselves in the game. And so, uh, yeah, true, player two is not ever really going to be both selecting C and E. However, for some really important uh, sort of theoretical reasons, it's, it's, it's a different strategy to say, hey, if you say A, I'm going to say C, but if, uh, if you say B, I'm going to say E. That's very different than if you say B, I'm going to say F. Why? Because those sort of other alternatives influence a whole bunch of other things. So that gets beyond kind of what I want to talk about here. 
uh, for follow-up, a really good game theory text is Joel Watson's Strategy. So that's what I recommend. Okay, that's actually the book that I learned game theory from before moving on to the graduate texts. So here is a two-player game in extensive form. So for an example, suppose you are hoping to launch a new product, but a rival is likely to launch a competing product. So we'll think of two scenarios, one where there's fixed cost of entry and another where there's no fixed cost, or one where there's no fixed cost of entry and one where there is a fixed cost of entry. So scenario one, if you and the rival both enter, you each get 25,000 or whatever, million. If each of the two firms is the only, if either of the two firms is the only entrant, their payoffs are 75,000 or million or whatever and any firm that does not enter earns zero. Okay, so you have two choices. You can enter or not enter. Your rival can enter or not enter. And so as I, as I write out the game tree, you choose either to enter or not enter. And following your move, your rival chooses to enter or not enter. Enter or not enter. If you both enter, you get the 25. If only one enters, they get the 75. Note the first number, that's player one's payoff. The second number, that's player two's payoff. Anyone that doesn't enter gets zero. Sure. So now let's solve this thing by backward induction. So you go to the end of the game, you identify the optimal strategy for the player controlling the last node, highlight that strategy, and then roll back to the preceding node, in this case, to the start of the game, and then repeat with the understanding that the player is going to the other player is going to disregard, the player is going to disregard all but the highlighted branches. Okay, so I'm going to go to the end of this game and I'm going to say, what's my rival going to do after I've selected enter? Well, if the rival enters, they get 25. If the rival doesn't enter, they get zero. Sometimes you might like underline and put a check here, just like you were doing in Matrix games. The Nash strategy, consistent with Nash play, has the rival selecting enter here. So I'm going to highlight over enter. And then I'm going to move on. I'm going to say, well, what if I didn't enter? What's, what's the rival going to do? Well, if they enter, they get the 75. They're the only one in the market. If they don't enter, we both get zero. So they would rather enter. So notice I've highlighted that the rival is entering. Matter of fact, the rival has a dominant strategy to enter, right? So now we're going to wrap back to the beginning of the game. And we're going to see, what am I going to do? So looking forward, if I enter, I'm going to get a payoff of 25. If, uh, if I don't enter, I am going to get a payoff of zero. If I enter, I'm going to get a payoff of 25. If I don't enter, I'm going to get a payoff of zero. And notice I'm ignoring this 75 and this zero because it's not going to happen. Because I know that if I enter, the rival's going to enter, I get 25. If I don't enter, rival's going to enter and I get zero. Okay, so I would rather get 25 than zero, so I'm going to enter. And so this is going to give us our outcome. Our backward induction outcome is going to be enter, enter. So outcome, both are going to enter. And so that'll, that'll be our, in, in equilibrium, both firms enter and receive payoffs of 25 each. Okay, so scenario two, suppose we have a fixed entry cost of 50. If you and the, and the rival both enter, you each get negative 25. Why previously your payoffs were 25 minus 50, uh, minus a fixed cost of entry from both of these leaves you with negative 25 each. If either of the two firms is the only entrant, their profits are 25. Where's that coming from? Well, previously the profits would have been 75 minus 50, which is the fixed cost of entry gives us 25. And if, if you don't enter, you get zero. And you also don't incur the, the 50 because this is an entry cost. You could think of this entry cost as being like the requisite capital build out or some investment in quality or advertising or whatever it is. Anyway, this is the game. So minus 25, minus 25, 25, 0, 0, 25, 0, 0. Again, solving by backward induction, we go to the end of the game. What's the rival going to do if we enter? Well, they like 0 better than minus 25, so they are not going to enter. What's the rival going to do if I don't enter? Well, they like 25 better than zero, so they will enter. Wrapping back to the beginning of the game, what am I going to do? Well, looking forward, I see if I enter, I'm going to get 25. If I don't enter, I'm going to get zero. Oh, so I'm going to enter, and the rival is going to figure this out and then decide not to enter. 
So the outcome here is going to be 25, 0. So here, only one firm enters. That's going to be the equilibrium. Only one firm in equilibrium. And there's a first mover advantage. And you are right. I could have done this the opposite way. And I could have had the rival moving first, in which case you're not going to enter. Right? OK, very good. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude here. I'm going to make another video on subgame perfect equilibrium. So go ahead, uh, like, subscribe, send a question, whatever. So.